Hello and welcome to Channel's Book Club. My name is Olakunle Kasumu and it's great to be on the show today. Our guest today is a man that I admire and I find fascinating and intriguing. His first book, A Fatherless People, is a book that, that has generated lots of conversations around the world. Now, his other book, he's written other books, by the way, but I like to call this The Other Book because I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. It's titled 50 Years of Britain. He spent the bulk of his life living in the United Kingdom, and he has a lot to say. He joined us at our studio, and we had much to discuss about this very fascinating book titled 50 Years of Britain. Let's get to meet with him again, and then enjoy the conversation. Dele Ogun is a historian, publisher, lawyer, speaker and author. Ogun, who is the convener of the Fatherland Group, is an alumnus of London Metropolitan University, the Chartered Institute of Taxation of England and Wales, and the London School of Economics and Political Science. Ogun was called to the English Bar and Nigerian Bar in 1985 and 1986 respectively. He is the author of several books including A Fatherless People, when you both came to Africa, Ostrich Nation, and the Law, the Lawyers and the Lawless, amongst others. Ogun joins Channel's Book Club to discuss his most recent book, 50 Years of Britain. Dilo, nice to have you on Channel's Book Club. Uh, thank you, Kunle. Thanks for having me back. Great to have you back. Your book, I mean, your book that got you on the show, that brought you on the show the last time, A Fatherless People, was such an explosive book. Uh, what has happened since then? A lot. A lot. I've been working on um, a review of A Fatherless People, the second edition. Uh, that's just to whet your audience's appetite. <laughs> They've got to wait for it. It'll be a while yet, yeah, but there's so much new material that's coming through on that one. I've been reading the biographies and autobiographies of all the colonial secretaries that have been in charge of our space and in charge of our destiny. And um, so much to share with your audience. That, that, that's a comes. sequel to A Fatherless People, that's, you mean? That's a follow-up to A Fatherless People, yes. That is going to be explosive, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't like to set the stage on fire too much. Um, but it, it will be interesting. Not explosive, but interesting. Did you, uh, um, I mean, outside of those who loved a fatherless people, did you get a sense that it was a controversial book from those who did not love a fatherless people? If you get what I mean. I get your meaning. Uh -huh. uh, yes, there was a, a lot of resistance to the contents of a fatherless people because it was challenging the orthodox and conventional narrative. It was saying things that people did not want said. Um, but I never got this. I, I expected those who were anti a fatherless people to come and challenge the contents. Nobody really challenged the contents, <laughs> which tells me something. Mm. That the work that we did to get things right, because we knew that the challenge was going to come. So I took tremendous care in making sure everything was carefully investigated. And I was assisted by the fact that I was relying on the evidence, the, the work of the uh, uh, opposing camp. It was their books, their writings, uh, not my interviews or my conversations with past actors. Uh, so it was very difficult to challenge. And then on top of that, of course, they're dealing with a lawyer who's used to testing and interrogating evidence. So I put it out there for them to say, if I'm wrong, come out and tell me. Mm. And um, we didn't get that. So mm. we must have got it right. The, what, what you said now in preparing for the sequels, very, very intriguing. You said you, you've read all the books, or most of the books, or many of the books, I don't know, maybe you correct me, um, of the past colonial um, secretaries. Correct. So they all had books, the roads. They all had books. I mean, take, for example, Joseph Chamberlain. <laughs> 
had books. This guy had, there were six volumes. Six. Six volumes of his autobiography. It's actually a biography rather than autobiography. Uh, six volumes, each volume running into 600 pages. Wow. So there's so much material. The, the one who followed him was, um, uh, or oh, his, his name escape, escapes me for a moment. His was three uh, volumes, each of 500 pages. So you see that there's so much content out there relating to the Nigeria story wow. uh, that we need to get to grips with. And that's what I've been tackling uh, most recently. Colonel Secretary, we're talking about the British guys who were in charge of the colonies. Yes, this was so the... So basically they knew everything that had to be, <laughs> that, the, everything to know. This was the Secretary of State for the colonies, just as you have the Secretary of State for Defense or the Secretary of State for Finance or whatever. This was the one... Who, who the buck stops on his desk. And on top of that, you've got a legacy uh, knowledge that has been passed down from one Secretary of State to, uh, to the other and in succession. And so that is where the Africa project, the Africa vision, the Africa plan is fleshed out. That's the policy level where they decide, for example, where will power go when we leave. Mm. That's what these books contain. You've read all those books. I've read them. I fear you. <laughs> I, fear, I fear myself. <laughs> I mean, there must be so much there. There must be so much hidden in there. Um, uh, well, hidden is not the right word because uh, They've the, written the, book, about the books are there. Yeah, the books are there. They, it's for us to do the work to, mm. to find out what is there. Take, for example, I was shocked when I found a, a straight admission that there were certain colonies they were never to be independent, hmm. either for strategic reasons or resource and economic reasons. So if you think about all the colonies that they had, and there's a principle, some are too important to us to ever be independent. Wow. And ask yourself, is it possible that we're on that list? Nigeria. Is it possible? Is it? I'm asking, I'm asking is it you. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there's a high possibility. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a high possibility that uh, we are on that list, probably for a combination of the two. Of course, the content doesn't go so far as to disclose the actual list, but it's, it's down to us to work by deduction and by inference to say how important a colony was Nigeria mm. within the context of the imperial project. And if we are satisfied that we were very important, mm. then it's quite possible. Indeed, I'll change that. Highly probable that we're on that list. Mm. Mm. That's serious. Deep. It's deep. Mm. Okay, now, one, uh, to, to bring you to this book, um, one, of, one of the things I picked up from a fatherless people is um, I got to understand your position in analyzing Nigeria, in understanding the Nigerian projects, the Nigerian uh, um, story. Um, you argued in that book that we need to trace our history back to the British. Yep. You practically blame the British for our for, our, for for all our problems, <laughs> for, for, I mean, basically, and that has been um, a, a that, that has been an idea that I've had you share yeah. a couple of times. Now, reading this book, Fifty Years in Britain, um, what was it when you were writing it? Was it an attempt to further explain, to unveil what actually goes on in? developed societies, the United Kingdom particularly, um, in the light of this theory of yours. Uh, but before you answer that question, or as you answer the question, I'd like you to just give a brief um, idea what this book is about for those who are listening out there, and yeah. then respond to that particular question. So that well, let, let me context. do it the other way around, mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, you know, the political questions are the ones that excite <laughs> me. This blame concept, let's deal with this blame concept. Uh, there are only, when you look at the Nigeria story, there are only two candidates for blame. Mm -hmm. 
We either blame ourselves or we blame those who made Nigeria. Those who made Nigeria. Because I think most people now understand that Nigerians did not make Nigeria. Be a diehard one Nigerian is who say, we made it. No, it's like we, don't, we didn't give birth to ourselves. Somebody conceived the project. Somebody did the bringing together of those 371 ethnic groups mm -hmm. and decided that they would go well together as one state, one political entity. And somebody named them. Mm. So when we deal with this issue of blame, do you blame ourselves, who are not the architects, or do we blame the architect? If, I, if it sounds like, or oh, blame the British, it sounds negative. But if the architect has designed your building and it's fallen apart, uh, there's subsidence, the, uh, the roof has gone lopsided, do you blame yourself? Or do you look to the architects and say, oh my guy, what did you do here? Mm -hmm. So I think Nigerians got to get comfortable. I'm trying to encourage them to get comfortable. It's all right to put the blame where it belongs. Yes, of course, I hear the argument that they are local actors. Of course. Even God works through human agency. Whatever he wishes to do on earth is through human beings. So <laughs> what more of the, the colonial architects. They will identify the ones on the ground who they will partner with or subcontract to. That's the reality. Mm. But when you've got a project like this that affects the lives of so many of us, not just now, those who have gone, those ahead of us, we must have the confidence we must have the honesty, I'll go so far as that, to say, put the blame where it belongs. It's the architects. And who is the architect? Those colonial secretaries. All those, all those books I've been reading is all about yeah. how they did it, the calculations that they were going through in terms of at which point do they hand over the controls. We didn't fix the date of independence. Mm. I spoke recently about the contrast between Nigerian independence and American independence. American independence, the British didn't fix that date of July 4th. 1st of October, did we choose the date? Mm -hmm. uh, so these are the realities that we must get comfortable with if we're going to re-engineer this. And so this book is um, is a sequel to my very first book. This is autobiographical. Uh, this is the climax of the story of that young boy that you guys owe a lot of money to because <laughs> he, he was taken out of this country at the age of seven. That's you, to be clear. That's me, yeah, to be clear. <laughs> uh, he was taken out of this country at the age of seven and sent over there to understand how things work over there, particularly at the political level, at the social political level, and to report back such that we can understand the experience that we've been through through the appropriate lenses. Mm. In, you can't solve a problem until you understand it. And mm. you can't... Um, understand this particular problem until you really understand the, the way of life of the architects, the British architects. So someone like me who has lived in Britain since the age of seven and spent 50 years uh, there as a Briton, living their way, thinking their way, I consider that I am in a unique position because I have the passion for history and the training in law, because the training in law is critical to the understanding of events. Lawyers, it's our everyday habit, especially trial lawyers. We're never there when the incident happens, when a contract was formed or when a crime was committed. 
our job is to reconstruct the events on the basis of the evidence that's available to us. And bringing that together, when you can transfer those forensic skills into the reconstruction of political, historical events, that's then what enables us to, our people, to understand the Nigeria story properly. Mm. And so this book, 50 Years of Britain, is a report back uh, to my fellow Nigerians. There is a letter mm -hmm. that you published here by Smithers. Oh, yes. Yeah? yes. Um, page 16. So you republished this letter written by um, Smithers, Sir Peter Smithers, mm. who was the parliamentary private secretary to the Minister of State and the Secretary of State in the colonial office from 1952 to 59 in the run-up to Nigeria's independence. Okay. Um, we don't like confronting things like this, do we? Correct. Yeah, I mean, this will be considered very controversial in Nigeria. Mm. But it is what it is. It yeah. was written. Absolutely. Um, during the negotiations for the independence of Nigeria, the view of the Secretary of State at that time, with which I agreed, was that in Nigeria we, we should attempt to put together a large and powerful state with ample material resources which would play a leading part in the affairs of the continent and the world. This was attractive, but it involved forcing several different ethnic and cultural groups into a single political structure. Mm -hmm. Forcing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And those are their own words. And this is the parliamentary private secretary to the Minister of State in the colonial office. Uh, specifically, it was uh, uh, Oliver Littleton and Alan Lennox Boyd that he was private secretary to. Hmm. The negotiations were complex and very difficult. The chief problem, as I remember relating significantly to the control of the police and the military, hmm. In the retrospect of 40 years, it is clear that this was a grave mistake, which has cost many lives and will probably continue to do so. It would have been better to establish several smaller states in a free trade area. Mm. Who could argue with that in the light of what we have all experienced and with what we have seen? This is the architects, one of the architects, without complaint, Potion, without pressure, writing that letter in his own words and admitting that it was a grave mistake. And this was dated 15 July 1998. Yeah. Hmm. Well, time is not our friend. <laughs> never, <laughs> never is. If, if we start talking <laughs> about this. This is we're warming up. <laughs> <laughs> if we start talking about this, I mean, it's, um, well, it's food for thoughts. Uh, it's food for thoughts. Thank you very much for joining us on Channel Thanks Book so much Club. indeed, Kuli. Always a pleasure. Always good to be back. And congrats on this. 50 Thank Years of Britain. And yep. I'm looking forward to that sequel. Yes, uh, the a, a next edition people. of A Fabulous People. And don't forget also the Africa Book Fair. We forgot to talk oh, about yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Maybe another interview. Yes, we will. We will. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>